Whether you're someone who sees the competition for the soul of modern society as something like an adversarial struggle, like a culture war, or something more like a diplomatic dialogue between potential friends, you should be alarmed by the trends that we are seeing in modern Western countries like Canada, where I live, or the United States, which from what I've heard is a place where some people also live. When pollsters ask people questions about whether they think things are going well or poorly in general, the data tends to portray a fairly pessimistic outlook. The Pew Research Center, for example, has been asking Americans as far back as 2017 and even further back than that, um, questions like, in general, are you satisfied with the way that the, the country is going? And the vast majority of respondents consistently reply that they are very dissatisfied with the way that things are going. In 2016, an organization called YouGov asked respondents, all things considered, in general, are, are things getting better or are they getting worse? And 68% of Americans said it's getting worse and only 6% thought it was getting better. And I don't think they're wrong. I think there's a general recognition that there is this stagnation and deterioration that is taking place in modern society. And I think we need to ask ourselves as this growing sense that things are getting worse continues, what is it that has been shifting over time? What is it that has been changing from a time when people uh, had more trust and more satisfaction and more optimism to our current state of melancholy? I think there are a few things we could point to, but one very big and glaring shift that is taking place is that we continue to embrace novel ideas about ourselves, about politics, about morality, about religion, in short, about the most important questions that we can ask about ourselves and about the world around us. And we don't seem to be putting the brakes on this shift. If anything, we are exponentially accelerating away from beliefs and ideas that were seen as traditional and that might correlate to times where there was greater trust and satisfaction and optimism. Um, to those that are claimed to be innovative and progressive merely because they haven't been tried yet. And if you're a traditionally minded person, for obvious reasons that should worry you. Because what is often referred to as the culture war, you're losing, we're losing. And if we're honest, we should be able to admit that something has to change in the way that we're participating in this struggle. I just want to say a quick thank you to one of the sponsors for my channel, which is Real Estate for Life, who is an organization that provides a network of real estate agents who will share your faith-based and your philosophical values uh, to help you find a home that is a good fit for you. And I can't express how easy it is to overlook the need for something like this. As someone who's gone through real estate transactions myself, having someone who who intimately understands your priorities as a family, about the neighborhood you want to live in, about the schools that will be close by, the churches. All of these things are something that a like-minded real estate agent can help you with. So if you are looking to move or invest or buy and you need a real estate agent, look at Real Estate for Life. You can find that at realestateforlife.org and they'll get, connected, get you connected to an agent who can help you. So what have we been doing wrong and what are we doing wrong? Well, whether you sympathize with the notion of this being a culture war or not, I think the one thing we all have to admit is that this is about culture. If you think of it in adversarial terms, then we have to do a better job of asserting our culture against other cultures. If you think of it in more diplomatic terms, then we have to do a better job of attracting people to traditional or Christian culture. There's only one huge problem though, which is that we don't have a culture to assert or to attract people to. We abandoned our culture long ago and adopted shades of other cultures, especially popular secular culture, which is the one that we should have been resisting. So what do I mean by this? Let me start by pointing out that it's not enough to have a creed, even a creed that very closely reflects the truth or communicates the truth. We have a creed, and if I could be so bold to say so, we are right about a lot of important things, about ultimate truth, about how we should live our lives, about who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. Our creed tells us these things, but people aren't merely rational. People aren't drawn to mere assertions of the truth without some kind of window dressing. And in fact, people will be just as likely to adopt and embrace well-dressed falsehoods. Nobody is going to adopt or buy into a creed when the people who supposedly profess it don't act like it's something that is worthy of its own distinct culture. 
Culture in this case could mean, you know, the music, the art, the literature, the rituals, the worship, and the way of life that proceeds from that creed. These are all things that the church has refused to uh, nurture or maintain for going on a century now. Culture is the embodiment of creed, or more accurately, it's actually the embodiment of religion. And a creed cannot survive if culture does not bloom out from its roots. And the culture of the church bloomed for 2,000 years until we decided in the interest of maybe not being too assertive or just because we took it for granted that we could neglect it or even discard it. In our struggle or diplomatic dialogue, however it is that you see it, we sacrifice the thing that motivated us, that renewed us, that, that made us attractive, that made us an actual distinct alternative from other options. And here's the real point of consideration. We did something that countless martyrs died to prevent. Take, for example, how during the Protestant Revolution, revolutionaries were seized with that old, uh, embittered spirit of iconoclasm. They stormed into sanctuaries uh, of churches and monasteries, smashing stained glass windows and destroying all the sacred art that they could find. But in the immediate aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, it wasn't some previously unknown adversary who came in and vandalized our sacred spaces. It was us. We did it ourselves. We were seized by that same spirit, but with the added contemptible ingredient of what Pope Benedict XVI might have called a pathological self-hatred. We literally brought jackhammers and other instruments of destruction into our holy, sacred spaces and set to the unfinished work of the revolutionaries. We abandoned the expressions of our faith that had inspired and aroused the affections of countless generations for the creed that we all profess, as well as maybe even the respect among those who don't profess it. And it didn't stop with ornaments, altars, paintings, and statues. We abandoned our language, our songs, our architecture, our ancient rituals, even our calendar of feasts, as if all those other concessions weren't enough. In place of this culture that we self-sabotage, we either contented ourselves with the nihilistic emptiness of the aftermath, or we tried to synthesize elements of other cultures into the residue and what was left over of our own. We were convinced that this would make us more attractive to non-Christians in our evangelistic and ecumenical efforts. It's as if the, the logic behind this was like, all we have to do to attract them to a creed that they don't want and don't have is to offer them a culture that they do already have, but much less sophisticated because we don't have the resources of, say, like a Hollywood, and much less authentic because it isn't actually born out of our own creed. We're just kind of play acting at someone else's. And as we should have expected, there was no wave of new converts. Instead, there was a mass exodus, which continues to this day and only seems to be accelerating. And this all came to mind for me when someone recently asked me, how old should your kids be when you start to teach them about the faith? And they were asking this because they were thinking of the faith as merely a set of ideas that need to be formally communicated through lessons. That is, they were thinking of the faith merely as a creed. My answer to them was that you start educating them from day one through cultural immersion. Um, culture is the best educator because that's that's what education is. Education is the transmission of culture. But if you have no culture, no unique, distinct culture of your own to transmit, you will never be able to properly educate your kids in a creed that does not produce interest, wonder, or affection. But if you do have a culture and you live and express that culture in your daily life, then that education is something that will happen in large strides without any formal lessons whatsoever. A story I love to tell people, especially those who assume that my kids must hate going to the traditional Latin mass, which is what my family usually goes to, is that one Sunday, my youngest son at the time, he was getting a little bit restless. He was like two or three at the time. So I picked, up, picked him up in that moment. And just in when I did, at that moment, there was a cloud of incense that was just floating right above us and caught the rays of sunshine through one of the stained glass windows. Now, incense is one of those things that uh, Catholic churches, at least where I live, uh, they stopped using it regularly, if not entirely, some time ago. And if, if you think about it, it's not really hard to understand why. It's something that hardline Protestants object to. They object to bells and sacred art, chant, ornamentation, and incense. They claim that it's unbiblical. Whether it is unbiblical or not, I would say that it appears that we took those kinds of criticisms to heart. And you can understand the rationale in this. It's, it's, 
it, it's assumed that it will be easier to dialogue with Protestants if we looked and look and act more like they do. So we sacrificed incense with quite a few other bathwater babies, and for some strange reason, they didn't. That didn't inspire the Protestants to look at us and say, "Hey, look, the Catholics they've they've sold out their culture. We should all just become Catholic now." So anyway, back to this story with my son. When I picked him up, he noticed this cloud of incense floating above us, and at the time he he pointed at it as it was glimmering in the light, and he goes, "Prayers, prayers!" all excitedly, and I remember at the time thinking, "Well, that's weird." I don't remember ever sitting you down for a formal catechetical lesson on Revelation chapter 8 in which it the Bible depicts the prayers of the people being offered up like incense, the smoke of the incense before the throne of God. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I didn't have to do that because it's something you instinctively grasp because of the associations between lifting our hearts and minds in prayer and smoke from incense rising up in church in the gleaming light of God's creation. It's kind of obvious. When we as a family pray, we will dim the lights down, we will light a bunch of candles, we kneel on the floor together, we turn to icons which portray the incarnation for us, and then we chant, we sing, we repent, and we do this all together with infants, toddlers, adolescents, and teenagers all represented. And the little ones who can barely even talk, they still love to participate. They sing in their own funny enchanted way. They kneel, they cross themselves clumsily, and they babble along with our own intentions. And yes, at a certain point in their maturation, and at certain points, we will have to give them formal lessons in the creed. But in our experience of doing so with our older kids, we've always found that they've been eager to do so because it's a creed that they've already developed great affection for because it's the source of rich family and community life for them. Now, I'm not the kind of person who insists that we've taken a wrong turn as a church, although I think we probably have, and that we have to return, return to the road that we've departed from necessarily. There might be a way forward to forge a new culture that can produce the kinds of effects that I'm describing, but it has to be a unique embodiment of our creed, not someone else's. As I've said in the past, Culture is to creed what words are to thoughts. If culture is the embodiment of religion, then our words are the embodiment of our thoughts. And you cannot use someone else's words to express your thoughts without severely risking becoming incoherent any more than you can use the culture of some other creed to express your own creed. And that's because creed always precedes culture just as thoughts precede words. We have this ridiculous mistaken notion in the church today that culture existed prior to our creed and that enculturation is the process of just taking pre-existing creed and adopting it in our pre-existing culture and adopting it into your creed when in fact true culture is something that again blossoms out of a true creed and that's what happened with the church and with its cultural identity and for us to find a way forward to to rehabilitate our own creed and the church and traditional values, however you want to describe it, we have to refocus our efforts on establishing and renewing and nurturing an authentic culture which comes directly from our creed. And if we want to make successful strides in the struggle over culture and, and belief in our society, we have to produce a culture that is worth fighting for, that is worth asserting, or that is worth inviting people to. Abandoning our own culture out of perhaps, I don't know, maybe good intentions to be less adversarial, that has only backfired on the church and it's time we concede that, it's time we admit that, it's time we forge a new path forward with an authentic culture of our own. Thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you feel called to support this work, then consider joining the Reinforcements, which is my online community. There are multiple tiers, including free access for those who can't help financially but still want to join. You can join up at www.brianholdsworth.ca. Certain levels will also get a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. It's like aromatherapy for your face. Even if you don't join, they make amazing products. So check them out at gloryandshine.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to agree with everything I said to get value out of these kinds of conversations. So be sure to subscribe to be edified or challenged. There's value in both.